And tonight, uh, as we went on Sunday to Pilate's Judgment Hall, we're going to hear from Pilate himself. Um, he was the Roman leader put in charge to rule the uh, whole region of Judea, and uh, including Jerusalem, and he did it on Caesar's behalf. And so tonight, we're going to go back to our Lenten tree. In our Lenten tree, we have our things from our Lenten bag that hopefully you all have by now. And if you remember, we put our red heart on there for uh, Mary's love and devotion to Jesus. We, we placed on there the praying hands of uh, not only blind Bartimaeus, but also of Jesus in the garden. We've uh, seen the cold, hard heart in response of Judas and Caiaphas to their experience with Jesus. And we've also um, walked with Peter, whose heart, um, the sign of the, the fish there, that, uh, you know, he, he was this fisher of men, and yet it wasn't always perfect. And, and we see forgiveness even in that, that black Ichthus. And tonight we use the purple heart with the, the broken line through it. Uh, it represents the royalty of Jesus and how his heart is broken for you and I. And so we'll place that on the tree as well. See, Jesus' heart broke on the cross because um, well that's, that, that's what this is all about. God's great love being poured out on us um, in a way that we don't deserve, and yet um, we get grace instead of punishment for our sin. And so tonight, as we look at Pilate's role in this, um, these events that Pilate is going through cause him much anxiety, because uh, by the letter of the law, Jesus was innocent. But the Jewish leaders had stirred up the crowd to a near riot uh, for Jesus to be crucified, calling for that. And so Pilate is in this place of trying to weigh out, giving in to the crowd, or doing what's right. And uh, he's struggling with what the best thing to do in this situation is. That's what he's wrestling with. And our theme verse for tonight is from Matthew chapter 27, verse 22. What shall I do then with Jesus who is called the Messiah? Pilate asked. They all answered, crucify him. We prepare for this time of worship tonight by remembering how God has called us himself by how we began all of our days in the Lord at our own baptism. We began those days in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We pray our prayer of confession. O oh, loving Heavenly Father, you set Israel free from the chains of Egypt's bondage, and you also set Barabbas free from Roman execution. Tonight, as we begin our worship, we pause for a moment to ask you to set us free from every prison that shackles and binds us. We do that by confessing our sins to you and seeking your forgiveness. We pause as we reflect on our sin. Forgiving Father, though I don't like to admit it, I am a sinner much like Barabbas. I'm a rebel and a wretch, born dead in trespasses and sins. Due to my sin, I am lost and without hope, doomed to perish. I have been blinded by the gods of this age and my best deeds are still soiled with sin. I must confess, Lord, that all my righteous acts are like unclean rags. The 
Yes, Lord, I am Barabbas. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Jesus walked the, to places of rejection and suffering and torment and death. And he did it for you and for me. He did it because he was determined to go to places like Golgotha and the cross and, and throughout this whole pan, all these passion places because he loves you and me so much. And because of that love, we can be at peace because of his great love and mercy, we are totally forgiven, totally and completely. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our gospel reading for this evening is from Matthew chapter 27, verses 11 through 23. Meanwhile, Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, are you the king of the Jews? You have said so, Jesus replied. When he was accused by the chief priests and elders, he gave no answer. Then Pilate asked him, Don't you hear the testimony they are bringing against you? But Jesus made no reply, not even to a single charge, to the great amazement of the governor. Now it was the governor's custom at the festival to release a prisoner chosen by the crowd. At that time, they had a well-known prisoner whose name was Jesus Barabbas. So when the crowd had gathered, Pilate asked them, Which of these do you want me to release to you? Jesus Barabbas or Jesus who is called the Messiah? For he knew it was out of self-interest that they had handed Jesus over to him. While Pilate was sitting on the judge's seat, his wife sent him this message. Don't have anything to do with that innocent man. For I have had a great suffering. Uh, I have suffered a great deal today in a dream because of him. The chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and to have Jesus executed. Which of the two do you want me to release to you? The governor asked. Barabbas, they answered. What shall I do then with Jesus, who is called the Messiah, Pilate asked. They all answered, Crucify him. Why? What crime has he committed, asked Pilate. But they shouted all the louder, Crucify him. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. We sing our song of preparation. Our Lord, you stood in Pilate's hall.
Here I am trying to write this report to Rome concerning the matter of the crucifixion of the Galilean, the troubles, the rumors. I hardly know what to say. I would have thought the mere mention of my name, or at least the authority of Rome, would have quelled the mob, for silenced the man himself. My name, Pontius Pilate. I wonder how the history books will remember me. I wonder if it's written and will do me justice. After all, I am a man of ambition, decisive action, I'm assertive, I'm in control, I'm loyal to the emperor, a man who brought order and stability to this little outpost of the empire. Goodness knows at least I've tried. I never wanted to be here in the first place, but you do what duty requires. Even if it's going places you've never imagined, you have to just put in your time and climb the ranks and live or die by your reputation and your name. My name, my name should be trumpeted through the streets of Rome for everything that I've had to deal with out here, but will it? Or will I forever be associated with this carpenter, this outback preacher, the crucified troublemaker, this bewildering poet? For a short time, he and I shared the world's stage, and high drama it was too. Pitting the powerful against the defenseless, the gladiator against the lion. It should have been no contest. No quarter should I have given him that day. Good Caesar knows I had it in my power to expedite this matter and be done with it. Why? Why did I give him a trial? Why, indeed, I'll be asking myself that question until the end of my days. And why did the trial go the way it did? I suppose others will be asking that question even longer. I'd like to start writing, but do I try to write down everything, or as little as possible? I'll just start at the beginning, maybe. But which beginning? And whose beginning? Somehow this incident is much larger than the characters involved. It's about a man from Nazareth, of course, but it's also about me and the Jews and their hopes and their relationship to the empire and their confounding God. Oh, stop rambling, Pilate. Just get it down on paper. Start at the beginning with that outrageous Passover parade. Yeah, that's where I'll start. There have been rumors for a couple of years, but that's all they were, were rumors, at least until I met him in person. But all those stories seem to confirm each other. They built credibility for my case. After all, the parade was the first day of Passover week that had all the markings of a revolt. Crowds in the street, shouts of acclamation of the Messiah, a deliverer from a people who imagined themselves repressed. Repression, indeed. They couldn't have asked for a better situation. After all, Rome had bent over backwards to keep this strange, insignificant set of people happy. Why? I have no idea. But for some reason, Caesar had allowed them to maintain their own temple and practice their own religions. It wasn't like that in other parts of the empire. Everywhere else that was conquered was to worship Caesar, our emperor. But for these people, he had even given power and authority to the chief priests and a special local court called the Sanhedrin. What more could they want? That's how it is with the people, isn't it? You give them one thing, they want another, and then another, and you give them an inch, and they want a mile, and you give them autonomy, and they want liberation. There's no end to the appetite. And that Passover celebration, Every year it was the same thing. They remembered some ancient story of their dusty old God delivering them out of dusty old Egypt, leading them through the wilderness to their promised land. Yes, of course they're subject to the supreme authority of Rome. Rome is Rome. It's her destiny to give order to the world. Why can't these people understand that? And this fellow comes along and talks of what? I never heard him preach. 
I don't know his stories and parables, I guess I've heard. But what are they about? About a kingdom of his God? I guess that is sedition. I can write about that. The seditious rumors, the mobs in the street, the nation clamoring for deliverance and claims they made that he was their liberator. Yes, that's what I can put in my report. And the betrayer, Judas Iscariot, a known zealot, a dagger man, an infiltrator, I imagine. Good for him. The priest paid him off with good old Roman coin, turned him over. At least some of them knew what was good for them, good for the umpire. They will be commended in this report. Thanks to Judas, we were able to trap him. With stealth, patience, a bit of bribery, and that well-trained soldier, we got him alone in the garden. I like the way the betrayal worked out. It was like clockwork. The soldier shadowing Judas in the garden where he knew Jesus would be. They're to be commended, too. <laughs> so much for revolution. It was easy to put them down. Sure, they had a bit of a scrap, but once again, the imperial forces reigned. We showed no mercy to the powers of the troublemakers. His followers knew that, and they ran like dogs. Things to that point were going well. The ringleader was under arrest. His fellow insurrectionists scattered, terrified, in hiding. And the next thing to do was procedural. Turn him over to the high priest Caiaphas and his lot and let them try him. They could turn him back over to me for sentencing. Caiaphas was well paid. He wouldn't risk his position with Rome for a backwoods preacher. They'd have a little God talk and it'd be all over. Caiaphas, now there was someone you could trust. So he went up and they set up the charge of blasphemy. Whatever that means. Well, whatever it means, it isn't good enough. What am I, a theologian? I don't agree or disagree about those things. He was on trial. I was the judge, so I needed charge and proof that would hold up in a Roman court of law. Blasphemy wasn't it. It wouldn't work for me or for Rome. A treason, sedition, plotting to establish a rival kingdom within the empire, that was worth pursuing. Surely the Passover crowd would be shouting at that after all. Caiaphas had witnesses, lots of witnesses feeding the agitation of the mob. The claims he was the son of David and the king of Jews, yes, that would get him sentenced to a cross if he would agree to the charge. Oh, that man. What can I tell Caesar about his trial? There's nothing to say. He made no claim as king. He answered my questions with confusing statements, almost accusing me of false accusations. But mostly, he said nothing. I went to the crowd, who by this time had become hostile toward him. How fickle these fools are, mindless sheep. One day they're clamoring for his coronation, and now a couple of days later, they're jeering at him. But I must remember that this is still part of Rome, and the empire strikes fear into people, as it should. Fear keeps the minions in their place. This crowd knew all too well I had the power to crush any of them like stones into pavement. Their fragile little leader was now nothing to them. His voice was rendered moot, by my questions, I suppose. So I turned to the crowd in a fit of whimsy and played them like a puppeteer does his puppets. I dangled their Jesus on one hand and the scoundrel Barabbas on the other and asked them, play a game with me. And they chose Barabbas and I washed my hands of the whole affair. I was tired of playing games with this spineless mob I'd show them all the strength of my hand and the power of Rome. The soldiers had had their way with Jesus. He was theirs to play with now, to beat, to torture, to torment, to tease. But I have to say, and I can't put this in the report, something else happened. There was more than dust and a few whimpers from his mother in the air that day. The sky darkened. 
It was an eclipse, I suppose. But even, even more, the earth stood still. There were chills up my spine, and then it felt like the earth itself was going to explode. After we died, everything was procedural. Arrangements were made for a place of burial. It was over. Another deluded prophet gone. Another rebellion crushed. We were done with this man for good. I hope that now the citizens of this little warm of the world will get him and his kingdom talk out of their heads as we seal the dream of their little god up with a big, heavy stone. You'll have to see what happens next over these next few days. found that man. What is the truth is really what was confounding Pilate as he thought about Jesus. After all, Pilate was large and in charge and was in a position where what he said would be accepted as truth even if it was the furthest thing from the truth. But no matter where he looked or how he tried. Pilate couldn't find Jesus guilty of a crime, let alone a crime that deserved death. But as we often do, Pilate gave in to the pressure. He breaks down as he tries to wash his hands of any responsibility in the matter and turns Jesus over to be crucified the will of the crowd. Under pressure from peers, society, and culture, too often we can struggle to be who God wants us to be. Like Pilate, we prefer to just give up and give in and try to wash our hands of any kind of responsibility to play the role of the victim. Guess what? That doesn't relieve us from responsibility or guilt. It just makes us liars and out of touch with the truth. Thankfully, Jesus is the truth. He's the way. He's the life. And the truth is that Jesus, our King, surrenders himself to be impacted and broken by the pressure of sin in our place. He takes on something that he totally doesn't deserve. Our punishment. So that, so that he can give us something that we totally don't deserve. Grace and mercy. As you reflect on your life today, where is God calling you to go differently in your journey? To take a different walk or different direction? What is he trying to get you to do to surrender more fully to him? Where are earthly pressures causing struggles in your walk with Jesus? He wants us to come Completely surrender everything to him, to trust, to trust all that we are and all that we do to him, the way, the truth, the life. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, you are the way, the truth, and the life. You are the king, the king of the Jews and of all people. You are king of king and lord of lords. We thank you for your good and gracious rule and ask that you, by the power of your spirit, would lead us to be more faithful citizens of your kingdom. Like Pilate, we often look to lots of other things in our lives seeking truth. 
Help us to grasp firmly to you, the one who is the way, the truth, and the life, and surrender ourselves fully to you. Continue to feed our hearts and minds with your word. Fill our hearts with your presence and empower us by your spirit to humble ourselves so that we may not just be selfish consumers looking to be pleased, but to be your true worshipers, longing to be consumed by your glory and grace. Empower us to believe and help us be faithful. These things and all else we need be placed before your throne of grace, trusting in your good and gracious mercy to supply all things according to your good and gracious will. We ask that it may be so in the strong and powerful name of Jesus who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation. But deliver us from evil. For thine is the power, the kingdom, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and he comes to us and tells us and shows us the immensity and the depth of his love as he takes on what we deserve to give us what we don't deserve. And in that, he gives us lavishly his love. And he pours out on us to the depth of himself. He gives his body and blood for you and for me because of that love. And in that love, we live each day. We go out to be the hands and feet of Jesus as we love him by loving and serving one another. As you go, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious on you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. Amen. Amen. We sing our closing song, We Join, O Christ, Your Journey. <laughs>
our midweek worship as we've, uh, through this season, we've heard from different people associated with the places of the Passion. But we're not done with the places of the Passion yet. This coming Sunday um, is Palm Sunday, and we're looking forward to some special things. But before we get there, as we've talked about before, we are a people of love. We are dearly loved by our Heavenly Father, and we want to share that love with others. So if there's something uh, that you're in need of, if it's prayer or some other need, please reach out to us. We want to, uh, to walk with you and, and to be there with you through that and help in any way that we can. Um, you can check out our website, you can email us, uh, or call the office, lots of different things. Our, our food ministries are open. Uh, Tuesdays we have the Lord's Covered Food Pantry from 9 to 11 and uh, 3 to 5. That continues to... Uh, to gather uh, steam with that, so please come and partake in that if you're in need. We also have our blessing box that's open 24 hours a day out in the parking lot. Uh, so any way we can assist, please let us know. With that, we, um, as we have been the last two Sundays, we're going to continue to be open. We wear masks. We take some safety precautions cautions as you come in. We are socially distanced, but during this Holy Week, we will be meeting in person. Um, and so, on Palm Sunday, we're going to have an 8 o'clock and a 10.30 service. Uh, both of them here in person. 8 o'clock is more traditional, like we have been doing, and our 10.30 is more of a blended service. Uh, we will continue to broadcast that as well. On Monday, Thursday, Thursday of Holy Week, we are going to be here at noon, 12 noon, and also at 7 o'clock in the evening. Uh, those are the same times we're going to have service on Good Friday as well. On, uh, I believe it's April um, 2nd. So April 1st, Monday, Thursday at noon and 7, April 2nd, Good Friday at noon and 7. And then on Easter Sunday, we're going to add another service. We're going to have our 8 o'clock traditional. We're going to have our 1030 blended. But we're going to have a sunrise service at 630. We're excited about that. We're going to be outside for at least part of that, depending on the weather. And uh, we're really excited about that. So we hope you can join us in one of those Easter services as we celebrate um, not only these places of passion, but what that passion meant and, and the, the grand finale as, um, as God shows us what this is all about, the, the ultimate gesture of his love for us as he brings us all to uh, victory over death and the grave. And so we hope that you can join us for that as well. In the meantime, go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.